what I'd like to do is, um, let's see, we, we have uh, about 51 minutes uh, in this final session, but the good news is uh, it's only two people. And even the better news is um, it's uh, primarily uh, Sonny Westcott. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody from the previous panel. We're going to go right into this next one. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Sonny Westcott. She's a dynamic and engaging meteorologist with DHS CISA. Uh, I've been a part of the extreme events working group at DHS that Sonny leads, and I've been a part of that for about nine months now. And it's amazing just how much information Sonny compiles each week on critical infrastructure and impacts and NOAA forecasts and outlooks. Uh, we have about, uh, I'd say, 50 minutes for this session, and I want to leave as much as possible for Sonny to take off and reach cruising altitude. Um, but just two weeks ago at uh, AMS, American Meteorological Society meeting in Denver, Colorado, NOAA announced that 2022 experienced 18 billion dollar events at a cost of 165 billion dollars billion dollars ranks third um, and 474 deaths which ranks eighth for a year over the last three years the united states has experienced 60 billion dollar disasters at a cost of 434.6 billion dollars and 1,460 people killed. Globally, according to an insurance broker, Aon, um, global economic losses from disasters in 2022 reached $313 billion, with less than half of them being insured losses. That's 57% above the 21st century average. So Hurricane Ian that hit Southwest Florida in September of 2022 accounted for 75% of the global insured losses with insured damages ranging between 50 and $55 billion. That makes Ian the second most expensive natural disaster the insurance company or insurance industry has ever faced. So clearly, we need to identify and sure up our critical infrastructure uh, that's getting pounded each and every day by elements and by humans. So Sonny Westcott from DHS has been working this issue, and as have others in DHS and NOAA and FEMA. And um, she's going to help all our brains better understand what might happen uh, when disaster hits. Now, I must alert you that Sunny is a wealth of information. Um, she will be sharing that with you in this session. Please do not attempt to read all of Sunny's slides. Uh, just listen and engage in the conversation when we go to question and answer. So tighten your seat belts, put your seats and tray tables in their upright and locked position. Sunny, it's a pleasure having you. And it's a part as a part of our extreme events uh, track here, and uh, you're cleared for takeoff. It's all yours. All right, great. I'm pretty sure my microphone's working. I'm gonna go ahead and working. share my screen. All right, so everything on my side should be good to go. It's all good. You look great. Excellent. Thank you. I have a cloud necklace. Hi, I'm Sunny Westcott. I'm a prior Air Force lead meteorologist. I now do weather for DHS. I've also moved around a little bit within the private industry, so I do a lot within extreme weather and its impacts to critical infrastructure. Uh, as a meteorologist, somebody who focuses on the science of things, I do work to collect the data to be able to give it out to others. I am not necessarily the one performing the study. Uh, I speak to it through my, my knowledge of the atmospherics and their impacts through critical infrastructure. I also have previously worked in different parts of CISA, learning things like the critical infrastructure sector, the emergency telecommunications end of things, uh, pretty much touching almost every component of CISA that I can get my hands on to really be able to understand the best way to communicate to stakeholders what's happening, why it's happening, how much worse it's getting, and some of the things that we might be able to start leaning forward on doing about it. So I always try to, to lean into things when we talk extreme weather about why we're seeing what we're seeing in the concept of why it's happening now, 
Uh, not necessarily what drove us here. A lot of people want to be able to point fingers. I stay away from all of that. I focus purely on the extreme weather and its impacts to critical infrastructure. So what we're seeing with a, a warmer atmosphere as a whole, even if it only goes up by a little bit in conceptual, if you see it go up by half a degree, your mind thinks, well, it's only half a degree. It's not that bad. Half a degree can cause a lot of atmospheric variation. You can have a more moist atmosphere that allows for more moisture to be pulled up from the surface. The warmer atmosphere is more expansive, which means your lows can be deeper. There's a lot that I'm gonna to talk to that's kind of gonna bring it down to that, that level of understanding for everybody. So a deeper low is slower moving. Uh, if you think about our atmosphere where we live in the North American continent in a carousel-like manner for our storm systems, they come from the west, they go towards the east, they go in up-down manner, so kind of forming a carousel as they go. And when we talk deeper low centers, you're imagining that the horses on the carousel are now going up and down in greater variation, or they're just heavier hitting as a whole. Uh, and so with the, the La Nina especially, that was something that we were watching going forward was the pull of the polar air, the push of the warmer air from the Gulf, these greater variations in latitude that was happening but progressing always from one direction to another for our major continental systems. The tropical belt moves in the opposite direction, which is why we see things come from Africa over towards the US, or we see things from the Gulf that may act erratically because the Gulf has the ability to be pulled in two directions. So there's a, a lot of variation that can end up happening, which is why it's always important that if you have questions that you can reach out to a meteorologist. I happen to be one of those that is just openly available to point you in the right direction for resources. So a lot of what you see here is gonna be other people's products, other people's graphs, their dashboards, all of these great resources. And that's really my main give to everybody is if you have a question about something that you can reach out to me and I will guide you to the SMEs for your particular sector, your particular weather event. I'll explain things to you in layman's terms. I'll give you presentation PDFs that you can hand off to stakeholders that you can read through, that you can pull data from and cannibalize because I cannibalize them. So it's a, a major sharing of information. And that's a big part of what CISA tries to do is really get the information out there and amplify it further. So I do run the Extreme Weather Working Group with CISA. And that works with all emergency managers that want to come into the group. We work with the regions. We work with our other interagency partners. A lot of people from this call, uh, the other panelists are actually on the working groups. I actually know quite a few people, which is amazing. Uh, there's a lot of wealth of information for if you have a question about something, you know, am I am, how do I know if my dam is going to burst upstream? How do I know if I'm in a floodplain? How do I know? You know, you can Google a lot of these questions and end up at the right spot, but if you wanted, you know, a very specific PDF book done for it, that's something that I can do, or I can point you to one that's already been created. How did we get here? A lot of people think about weather in that cyclical uh, every 30 years, because that's when we do climate studies, as climate studies as a whole are typically relative to the longer term. So a lot of people seem to think that every 30 years, the cycle restarts. Uh, that is not the trend, as you can see here from the 1900s to now conditions have changed significantly, not just in the West. And I feel I should emphasize that when we talk about drought this past year, we saw Massachusetts do water restrictions. We saw impacts. New Jersey reported the largest wildfire that the state has ever seen. Uh, we have New Mexico also last year, but we talked predominantly about New Mexico because it was so large. So what's happening is that for every degree of warming, and that's in Celsius, so about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, the atmosphere holds more moisture. What does that mean all the way up the water vapor layer? Not a lot of people know about the water vapor layer, but if we were to talk about it in sense of down here at the surface where we live, it means that your water events, your rain, your snow, uh, your freezing precip, hail, all of that can have more precipitation now available for it as it comes into your area. These larger, deeper lows as they come in now are able to pull from higher in the atmosphere down to the surface. So while we're not currently saying, no, you're not gonna see rain, we're saying you're in a drought and when you do see rain, it is gonna to be too much rain at once. It is going to be perhaps even more than a month's worth of rain at once. We saw in other places across the, the globe last year, we saw Yemen and Oman reporting uh, variations in rainfall where one day produced almost three years worth of rain. Australia reported five one in a thousand year flood events. We also reported five one in a thousand year flood events. China reported four, Europe reported four. Uh, there's a lot to be said about what's happening is not just happening in the U.S. And it's not something that just started. It was building to this point and we're starting to pay attention now because the impacts are becoming very damaging at the same time our infrastructure is aging. So 
When I talk about water vapor and how it impacts all of us, when you talk, think about the water cycle, each raindrop as it comes down, what additional damage it can do, heavier rainfall hitting the ground, acting like a scoop, scooping off all the additional soil, dumping it into the river system. What's in that soil? Well, we have the wildfires that are getting larger. They're burning hotter because they're burning more of our scraggly brush that's growing back between the fires. That's not ideal. Drought conditions dry out our vegetation. That's also not ideal. So these hotter, larger fires damage the soil in the area, and they also aerosolize a lot of our minerals and metals that we don't want in the atmosphere. They turn them into particulates. Those get carried by the wind a lot further than we know, and they get deposited. Where do they get deposited? On our mountains, into our rivers, into your wells, onto your farmlands. There's a lot of additional threat that can come from that as that gets scooped off and into the river system. Once it's in the river system, we're starting to see now an increase in things like our toxic algae blooms, which feed off of some of the minerals and metals that come from the wildfires. But also when you're in a drought and you have lower flowing rivers, those lower flowing rivers, all of the drying of the, the riverbed ends up feeding those as well. Larger algae blooms create a secondary issue. What else comes from the amount of sediment that gets into the water? Well, if you have all of this uh, hydrophobic layer that develops from the fire and then the rain comes down, scoops all of it off and dumps it into the river, you have a higher sediment level in your river, which means you have more dirt filling from the bottom. So you might think conceptually, oh, we're good because our water level is at X, but you're actually filling the base of your water layer up. Uh, and you end up having to either redredge that or you have to recalculate your reservoir levels. So there's, there's a lot to be said about the continuation of threats. The lows being deeper also means that they're slower moving, which means the period between your lows is gonna have more direct heating that's gonna allow for higher evaporation trends. There's a lot of prolonged threats that come from that. So this graph kind of just shows you where we're seeing these heavier rainfall events, where we're seeing less rainfall. As you can see, it varies very significantly. Uh, the more evaporation that we have, the more available to come back down all at once, but then, a drying period again on the back end of that. So while we talk about California and the multiple atmospheric rivers it got, it saw so much water in such a short period of time. And then what happens if we, like last year, had a major event kickoff and then nothing for two months and it all dried back up again. We have these threats going forward, but not just in the West. This is happening over here in the East as well. It's happening in the Northern Plains. We've seen hydroelectric shutdowns on the Missouri River. We've seen water shortages on the Mississippi River. We've seen reports of impacts in Maine and Buffalo where they're seeing twice as much snow as they would by this time of year. And then subsequently last year that they were in a drought. So we have this pendulum swing in intensities that really go twofold. So the record setters and the things that we talk about when we talk about major threats, in the bottom left, you'll see that billion dollar disaster map that we were discussing. Uh, that's a, a pretty notable amount of impacts. Essentially, every portion of the U.S. faces some level of threat from weather every year. Uh, they all have their flavors of severe. When we talk extreme, it's that next step forward. It's going, okay, well, you had severe weather, but this is so far outside of the range of what is typically severe that we have to categorize it as an extreme. And that's really what I focus on. I take the information that's available and I just kind of give it to you in a way that's more digestible. So we can see that we were drier than normal, hotter than normal across various areas, but that we also saw some, some relative averages, right? Areas where it's white on the map because it's, it's pretty normal, but it was hotter than normal, which means we still have cascading impacts. There are other things that also work within our, our atmosphere that change some of the things that we experience. This is one of the more fun ones I get to tell people about because they think it's fake. The moon wobble is a whole secondary impact that we don't necessarily consider on the day to day. It's starting its shift towards what is a more damaging event for all of us here on Earth. So what we've got with the moon wobble is we know it rotates around the Earth, but we also don't pay us, the, those of us down here on the surface, don't necessarily pay attention to the, uh, the wobble, the tilt that it does as it comes around the Earth. That's extremely exaggerated. It's a far slower tilt. But what a lot of people think when they think that the moon controls the tides is that the moon is pushing and pulling the tides. When really what it is is that the moon kind of pulls it or it pushes it. It's in one or the other based off of its tilt. And we just rotate within that droplet of water that is being held captive essentially by the moon. So when the moon pulls one direction, all the water kind of pulls a little bit with it. And then we rotate within what is a higher pull on one side. Now that's important to understand because that's coming up pretty soon going into the next decade. And if we're seeing a higher than normal sea level rise from the heat, glaciers melting, increased runoff, the additional threat of water expansion on the surface when water gets hot, 
it expands. That's why boiling water on your stove boils over, even though you only had a set amount in there. Exact same thing is happening on our river system, on our ocean system, plus your glacier melt, plus your permafrost melt, plus the heavier rainfall, and now this. So here to say that this is only going to get worse and we have to do something about it. So going forward, we look at, this was from the initial um, global change that we did uh, back in 2014, this came out. So 2014, we were starting to look at, okay, who's gonna be below the increasing high tide? Well, a good amount of our population chose to live in areas that are at threat of these increasing tides before we got to the stage we're at now where we're really looking at sea level rise being worse than even this map depicted. Even at your highest emission scenarios, we're starting to see that we might bust those. So there's a lot to be said about planning for the worst case scenario because the worst case scenario from 2014 is becoming more and more highly probabilistic for our best case scenario going forward. So looking at where we were seeing the large wildfires uh, beginning to kick off, yes, of course, the Western United States is gonna burn more. There's more desert landscape. They have the Rocky Mountains, which means a lot of the precipitation hits that wall, drops off, rebuilds its energy, and then starts back up again in the Central Plains and moves eastward. So there's a whole swath that doesn't get rain that's over there in the West. However, Florida burns quite often. Alaska burns a lot. We're starting to see a lot more wildfires make their way up into the North. We saw the marshes of Michigan catch fire this year. So if we're seeing bogs burn, we're seeing marshes burn, we're seeing the New England states burn, it's becoming a problem for everyone. And looking to the West to see what best practices they have is a really big part of what I'm doing. Looking at the wet bulb, uh, this is something as a meteorologist, some of us are more familiar with than we'd like to be just from our skew T days. Uh, the wet bulb temperature is kind of like when you go outside and it feels soupy and you hate it and you go back inside because you don't want to be in it. So you go to an air conditioned facility. Uh, that's essentially the wet bulb. It's an awful feeling. As somebody from the desert southwest, I do not like humidity. And I moved to the mid-Atlantic because there's water here and there's not water in the desert southwest. And I knew what was coming, so I moved. So if you look at where we're at with this threat, what, what does this threat mean? It means a higher risk for people who go outside. Your emergency managers who are responding to an incident on hot days, your firefighters working on these days, your police, your anybody that needs to go outside, your electricians who work to bring your power lines back on. If it is so hot and so humid that there's a threat of death on the table, you have to take that into consideration. How many breaks do they need? Where are they taking these breaks? You could be in shade, in loose fitted clothing, drinking water and still die from wet bulb. That's how realistic it is that it cooks you from the inside out. It is a huge threat going forward, but it also reduces evaporative cooling, which we use for our cooling towers, which runs our electricity, our data centers, a bunch of other things, cascading impacts. Uh, so this is just something that really fuels into not only will our people suffer, but our infrastructure will also suffer just from higher heat and higher humidity, not even taking into account that those are the perfect ingredients for worse storms. So moving forward, this is again taken from the fourth national climate assessment. This is what they were expecting to see observed through the lower and the higher emission scenarios. I like to take other people's data and just kind of make it like consumable in very easy slides. Uh, some of my slides, as were mentioned, are usually a lot more wordy. I tried my best to like make these less wordy and more picturey. Uh, so this is just something you take this, you look at it, you're like, okay, it's supposed to get hotter. Uh, rainfall is going to have a major shift in pattern. We're going to see rain, but it's going to be all at once in a lot of instances, and then nothing at all, and then all at once. And we did not build our infrastructure for that. We built it for a lot more stable of a climate. Risk Factor is a great nonprofit industry that has just started to come out with all these great maps over the last couple of years. These are available open source online. I've linked to it. They also came out with a new one that is a pay to play service for critical infrastructure, but it's not for your home. So you can get a report for your home and just kind of look at it. The benefit here is that they've taken some of the updated proprietary data and they've integrated it with NOAA's maps. So some of these are a little bit more advanced. They are working with a lot of NOAA data, just as I do, to be able to amplify out the message, the concerns, the threats that are coming, where they're coming. These are integrated into Realtor.com to try to give that information to people before they buy a home, before they move into a new area, because we are going to see climate migration. Climate migration going forward is going to be a threat because maybe they move into an area where resources are already stretched. Maybe they move into an area and they don't know what severe weather that area gets on the regular and they're not prepared and now they're a risk for your community. So then we look at, well, where are we going weather-wise? So a lot of you know that we're shifting with the current Enzo index. We're going over to El Nino and everyone's like, oh, well, if it's El Nino, then 
surely sunny that means we'll see rain and it'll be great and my response is just like where did you get that just because we're going neutral also does not mean neutral does not mean good it just means a change it's important to look at the past years so we look at climatologically what happened during the last neutral enzo index this isn't even going into el nino yet there were billion dollar disasters each one of those years. So that right there is a major flag, stop loss. That means that argument goes out the window. If there were billion dollar disasters just for California, that that each of those years that were neutral in the most recent history, right? Then you're just like, okay, well, what, what were the disasters? Floods, fires, okay, neither of those are great. Drought and heat wave, oh, awesome. So then we look at El Nino. What does El Nino have the ability to do? It has the ability to cut off the monsoonal flow which will damage the amount of precipitation that comes to the desert Southwest. Is that a guarantee? No, it is dependent upon each of the lows that comes into the area and the overall shift that we see. If we get our monsoonal flow, but the let's say Mexico mountains don't get the precipitation, then we won't get it either. And that'll be a cascading impact. So no, the shift to El Nino does not automatically mean we're out of drought. It just means that things are changing in the pattern for where your storms come in. If you think of it as the carousel that I mentioned earlier, the up down of the horses, you know, sometimes they have the chairs in between the horses that just ride straight. Think of it like that. You're still on the carousel and those chairs can still move a little bit and they still have the ability to continue forward in between horses. You may still get the horses. So that's really what I try to advertise when I talk to people is that one thing is not a solution as was said earlier. I do do some international work as well. If you're uh, traveling abroad or you just have a question about another country who's doing some things, as was mentioned earlier, Israel does phenomenal work with water retention. Uh, they've led the way since the late 70s. Good, good job for them. That is great work. We're looking at some of the other areas. What are some things being done right now? Turkey started with the floating solar over their hydroelectric. Uh, the Netherlands have started with their hydroelectric dams and the solar panels going on the actual dams themselves. We're really leaning forward on who's doing what, where, and what, what's starting to work, what yields a positive result. So we looked here at some of the infrastructure that they had of concern along the coastal areas, further inland, airports, roadways, runways, uh, their data centers, because this looks very similar to some of our areas. And then you have to see, okay, well, what are they, if they had a drought, which they did last year as well, what did they do water restriction-wise? What did we do water restriction-wise? Which one sat best with both your public and your emergency management? Leaning forward on some of the tools, again, like I said, I take, 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 and I share. So I love to share and I love to take. I find new things and I, I put them into consolidated products. I show people some of the things that they provide. Heat.gov has amazing products. People can reach out to me and be like, hey, Sunny, you know, I really want to find a GIS layer for the heat map for Los Angeles so that I can start talking about what trees we should plant. I'm like, oh, that's great. I know exactly where that's located. Pull that data, get that, you know, here's how you get the GIS layer. And then I go over and I'm like, okay, now that you have that shape file, great. Let's talk about not planting all of the same type of tree because let's say a disease comes in, a beetle comes in and it loves that one type of tree and all of the trees die. Then you've done all that work for nothing. You have to have a certain percentage of different trees, but should it be eucalyptus? Absolutely not. Eucalyptus catches fire super easily. All of that scraggly brush cannot be planted. You need robust trees, fire resistant trees, things that can handle being in the drought things that will pass on proper information to their seedlings and not the memory of the heat wave and the drought that they've been in. So making sure that you also get and source your seedlings from proper areas as well. There's a lot to be said about mitigation strategy. Other climate tools, avalanches. So when we talk major snowstorm events, major precipitation, avalanches come with that. Every time you think, well, great, it's awesome. All that snow, we needed the snow. You don't need all that snow at once. Nobody needs that much snow. We have seen so many avalanches kick off. We have seen over 500 mudslides in California from the rain. Too much precipitation is bad. It is damaging. Uh, and to be said, it, it can leave just as fast, but it does more damage than good typically. You need it spread out over an even period of time, and that's what we're not seeing. That's the concern. So going forward, that bottom left bills on the billion, builds on the billion dollar uh, damages. You can see that we used to be prepared for one or two of the events on the severe side, borderline extreme, we were good. And then we started to see different events throughout the year, but each event. And then we started to see multiple reoccurrences of major events, and now they're all stacking. So yes, you used to be prepared to handle what had happened in the past, correct. It is 
Now, either the exact same, but with five other major disasters at the same time, or they're all worse. So either way you spin it, it's worse. Uh, the NOAA Climate Mapping for Resilient Ad Adaptation Tool, the camera as they call it, phenomenal tool if you want to be able to find information specific to your county, your city, your zip code, or your home. It will tell you where you sit within the current models uh, based off of, you know, how much it's supposed to get warmer. How many more days is it going to get warmer? That means how much more is your HVAC going to pull for your building or your work site? Going into drought, wildfire, flooding, and then it shows you composites of additional information. Where to go about some of the best practices. How to mitigate flooding based off of some of the things the states are doing right now at the local level. Other things like the Atlas of Disaster, if you have a team who has the time to read that document, it's like 800 pages, it's an amazing document. It talks about, okay, you have fire, here are all of the subsequent impacts from fire. You have flooding, here's a bunch of subsequent impacts from flooding. Essentially what I do in a one hour long presentation where I talk at this speed, if not a little bit faster with very packed slides, the Atlas of Disaster does too. So if you were like, I wanna know a lot more about this one thing, check there and see if it's available. And then if not, pursue other options as well. But it's a resource that is available, came out last year, phenomenal. There are other ones too, specific to your state. I list out a bunch. Climate Central did great work with the flood mapping that they do coastally. It's got a really fun map to play with where you can go forward in years. You can go upward in height of water that surges in. It can go from the coast further inland. You can check like the Houston Shipping Channel and see what it looks like with 30 feet of water. That's a lot of water, but it gets the picture across of how much water is too much water. Uh, and I've put in all these links. These slides are available to everybody and they will be sent out at the end of this. Uh, live weather tracking. So I, I, you know, obviously Storm Center has their own products as a geo collaborate dashboard. These are available just to everybody, open source. Um, the obvious, the NASA one for firms is great for fires. They have little fire icons. It's great for a dashboard display. You can also pull and display it in other geospatial maps. The Esri platform that shows you storm reports, that's phenomenal if you need the validation. If you want to look to see where damage is being done, storm reports are great. Being able to use progression charts for your fronts, track where fronts are going, what they're doing, what's expected with them. All of that's available there. The tornado outbreaks, you can run your own algorithms using the data that comes out of the storm reports page. How many tornadoes usually happen in March? How many have happened every March for the past 15 years? You can pull that data and run your own stats if you don't believe in what the scientists are telling you, which I obviously am a scientist myself, but I can point you to where the raw data is and you can run the same studies. So all of these arguments of, I don't think it's happening, I don't need to prepare, you can battle them with these, these slides essentially. I provide these sources. What does CISA do specifically? As the lead meteorologist, this is a big part of my wheelhouse to give out to everyone, is if you have questions, you can ask. You can reach out and say, you know, my division's looking at blank. If you're a federal agency, if you're an emergency manager, I've helped with graduations, uh, as small as a high school graduation before. I have no problem pointing you to the right resources, giving you forecasts, giving you data that you can use, uh, bringing you into the fold on conversations that are being had. You know, maybe you want to know, Sunny, I'm, I'm with blah, blah, blah. I would like to have a PSA from CISA come out and do a risk assessment for my site. That's something that CISA does. We have the RAPs that look at major product development for specific topics within the regions. We have a lot of stakeholder engagement that we can open up to people. I also provide exercise support. Uh, for those of you who are like, I would really like to have a fake double hurricane landfall in region four, the Southeast. I've made that and it's me recorded like a broadcaster. It's hilarious. Um, and it's all done through PowerPoint. Uh, I also produce these. These are weekly bad news reports. They are very dense. They are about 17 pages of links, stats, maps, graphs. Uh, and it talks about everything that's made the climate headlines in the, the last week. So it's a lot. It's national and international. So as you can see on here, Zimbabwe, the largest man-made uh, hydroelectric facility is at less than 1% for its water. And they've had to shut down. What does that mean? That means that Zimbabwe and Zambia have no hydroelectric power capability and they're starting to see blackouts. That's a problem. I report on the Middle East. I report on the UK. I report on when I can get information for China and Russia. It goes in there. All of their global climate information goes into here. The reservoir information goes into here. If you want to track the reservoirs on your own, you absolutely can. I went out and got the data and I provide it to you so that you can see it too. 
Uh, you can just email me. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can just be like, you know, I don't want to talk to Sunny. I'll talk to anybody else. That's fine too. I don't have that big of an ego when it comes to that part. I have an ego and other things. Uh, but look, CISA products, as was mentioned earlier, the drought and planning guide, drought and infrastructure planning guide, uh, resilient power best practices. If you have a facility and you're like, how do I know how resilient I am to power outages, power damage, grid shutdown? That document is great. It gives you a tiered rating at the end of it. If you like match X amount of resiliency sources, you can find out how structurally sound electricity, electricity wise you are for resiliency. You need to just tear it through the levels. Uh, it's a large document. It's very technically written. Um, I, I would recommend that if you have engineers that they review that document. Uh, the infrastructure resilience planning framework that came out most recently was updated. All of these are available through those links. Uh, there's going to be a lot more coming soon. CIS is updating its website to be able to have a climate hub for resources. And what that does is essentially what I do here, where I send you to all of the other things and I show you all of what's available that I know about. And then I will update it as I get more stuff. It's going to be great. Look at this. I've tried to make extreme weather fact sheets for people. So I've touched on eight of the major weather events. These are in draft, which is why it says draft. Uh, so each of these weather, major weather events, I have attempted to make a fact sheet for. The fact sheets cover what the event is, why it's getting worse, and where it's getting worse, and then some of the options for consideration that might be able to be utilized to stave off impact through mitigation. So those are still under review. These are not available for release, which is unfortunate, but we'll get there. Uh, it's got to go through a lot of collaboration with NOAA and FEMA. I want to be able to integrate a sort of best practices master list with FEMA and NOAA to make sure that the BRIC program for funding is there, that it falls in line with the camera tool so that we, we have this buddy up system of what can we tell people so we're all in tandem in our step going forward. Uh, there is a lot of work being done by, as was said earlier, by your scientists that are dedicated to this mission and work way too many hours. We are very intent on trying to get there as fast as we can. We know what's coming. So extreme heat, these are some of the different options, some of the different like sectors I tried to draw to. If people were like, you know, Sunny, this option's a terrible idea or have you considered this? Please reach out, let me know. Uh, worst case scenario, I tell you I've considered it, but it's, it's either too big of a scale or too small of a scale to be able to be modified out. But maybe it's good and I should look into it. These are why scientists exist in the social media sort of market is I want to be able to communicate back and forth. Extreme cold, all of the impacts that it can have. In the left, you can see that I cover down on what's causing damage, what could be damaged, you know, freeze kills crops, freeze can damage pipelines, freeze can do all of these things. Here are some things you could do about it, you know, insulation, doing these things, the huge list. I, it's a lot of words and it might be very small for you and I'm so sorry for that. But as I said, these will all go out. These are open source things that have been tried in other areas uh, and whether or not that they, they are something that we can advocate going forward, we are not at that stage yet, but they are being tried. And it's important to point out that yes, there's a lot of doom and gloom, but there are also some roads for consideration for, for movement. There is not one answer, as you can see. I would have easily made it a smaller slide if there was one answer. This took me forever to do. Uh, I had to go through everything that could be done uh, with the toxic algae blooms. We're starting to see some of the different labs come out with things that can break them down or consume them. But we also, with every one of these resiliency measures, we have to be smarter this time around and look at how that could damage something in the future. If we do a solar field, does that create a localized heat field? If we do what Arizona did and we create a spire with a bunch of mirrors facing it, do we create death zones for things that fly into the light and explode from the heat? Uh, if we do floating wind farms, are we cooling down the surface of the temperature of the water there and causing you know, a small ecology impact to that region? There's a lot with each of these resiliency things that has to be considered going forward. And that, that's a big part of what we're leaning forward on over the next year. Prolonged drought, drought's got a lot of impacts. That's my biggest fact sheet by far. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do in small parts, cover crops, uh, looking at black and gray water recycling, which are my favorite thing. And I will tout, I, I will make so many fact sheets on black and gray water recycling in the future. You will see 
me advocate that when a lot of people are like, Sunny, where, what's the answer? And the answer is mainly going to be that things have to start being done at the local level. Yes, FEMA is here for you with funding with BRIC. NOAA is so helpful with all the graphics. They're trying to show you what's coming. They're trying to show you where, how bad it's going to be. And you have to be able at the local level to take it and move forward. You can't just take it and be like, oh, okay, cool. We'll, we'll, we'll hire more people. We'll be ready when it comes. You should stave it off from coming because that damage as your infrastructure ages is going to be more costly. It's going to take longer to repair. Supply chain delays are already evident, let alone with the more severe weather. Looking at sea level rise, a lot of our charts and graphics that come out may not take into account the moon wobble that we talked about, which means, again, your worst case scenario may end up being your best case scenario in a couple of years as it warms at a rate that we are not ready for. We have in many instances already exceeded our initial goal of keeping the temperatures down and we have to start planning for those worst case scenarios. Uh, and I cannot advocate that enough. And again, I wanna say sorry that this is very negative, but look at all the positives. They're just in very small font. Uh, there's the change in Tornado Alley to also include Dixie Alley. This has been a change over the past decade where we've seen more tornadoes kind of in both areas, not just shifting from one to the other, but just expanding. Uh, we get the most severe weather globally, which is really interesting. We get pretty much uh, the most hail events. We get the largest swaths of large hail. We don't have the record-breaking largest piece of hail. I believe Mexico holds that. Uh, but we have the most amount of all of these events, which gives us the best field of study. That also gives us the greatest need to be able to move forward going into the resiliency planning. So as you can see, I'm just kind of like letting you look at these while I talk at you, but uh, I think I'm almost at the end. Here's tropical cyclones. Uh, we talked about those just a minute ago. So there is a lot to be said about how much damage they've already done. But if we look at how Fiona took out the power grid in Puerto Rico, Fiona, when it initially began impacting Puerto Rico was just a tropical storm. It produced an insane amount of rain. Ian produced record-breaking rain. All of these statements, when you talk about the tropical cyclones, we're like, oh, it's a record-breaking this, it's a record-breaking that. These are against a very long period of data to be record-breaking every year, every storm almost. We're getting to a stage where it really needs to start being understood that it's just getting worse. There's too much rain falling too fast. The wind speeds are getting faster than we've built the infrastructure for. Uh, and we're just, we're not ready for the sea level rise as it stands. We just are not. Uh, and I, I cannot emphasize that enough that things need to be done about it. So if you're like, Sunny, I want you to tell me more bad news all the time, please reach out to me. Um, the Extreme Weather Working Group is open to emergency managers, other federal agencies, uh, the local water sector, local power plant owner. If you want to be on there, you're able to be on there and have a seat at the table in order to communicate with others. Uh, that's something that I chair. I facilitate all of that back and forth. I bring in keynote speakers, private industry people who want to show you the cool things they're doing. I'm all about that too. I am not I am not here to stovepipe the data. I am here to share it as much as humanly possible because this is going to impact everyone. So with that, I believe that's the end of my presentation. As you can see globally, the, the majority of the impact there is temperature-based. So that's not great. Uh, it feeds a lot into what I just said. I will pause there for questions or hand it back to you, Dave. Did I go over on my time? Am I good? You are you are fine, Sonny. I, I you got done with a with some time left to ask some questions, and uh, I, I see a bunch of um, comments in the chat. Fantastic work, Sonny. This is a crazy awesome presentation. So um, you rock from uh, from a lot of people. So I'm going to turn over uh, really quick to the question and answer um, uh, area because I want to make sure that. Uh, some questions do get answered. Uh, and it gives you a time to uh, take a sip of water if you want to. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the first question here is, um, uh, how do you deal with nations that will not cooperate and they have a large impact on weather like China? Ah, so China, fun, fun things about China is that China is willing to blow up whole cities that are minimally populated to be able to create whole new cities to see if like a sponge concept works. And they're just like, yeah, you know, we're going to try sponge cities. We're just going to do it. And they, yes, concrete, that much concrete being put out at once is terrible for the environment. But we learned a lot from them doing that. We learned a lot about 
how much concrete can absorb, what that does to that cityscape. Their hydroelectric failed in multiple river systems. We saw what happens when you have to shut down power to a major manufacturing city. What does that do in the global supply chain? So they're not playing ball, they're suffering. They're, they're absolutely suffering. They're suffering far more than most other countries with the exception of the Middle East as an entirety. So if you were to look at China as a perfect example of what happens if you just ignore science and you just do whatever you wanna do, China has great studies being done along the coastal areas, phenomenal research coming out at the same time that they're shooting themselves in the foot. And that's the, the realistic nature of it. Being able to make them do something about it, that, that's not my wheelhouse either, but I can take the data uh, similar to like COVID, when COVID came out, some countries didn't want to do vaccinations or masks. We could use the data from them as a control group and be able to really see what happens if you don't do something about it and then use that to project forward. We saw what happened there. They, there are weather systems go around the entire globe in that direction. The same weather that they get, we get. They have a different topography setup, but it's the same low pressure system able to take that moisture, able to do the same things. They get a monsoonal flow over there in India, and we can see what happens if you don't build up your infrastructure, but we can also see what infrastructure is still standing. We can see which one of their railway tracks is the strongest. Why is it the strongest? Is it the soil it's sitting on? Is it the rock? Is it the type of material the homes are made out of? We saw roofs collapse from nine feet of rain total accumulation during one of the storms that they had because they built in a valley in the deepest part of the valley. And we're like, oh, we also have built into our valleys. I'm looking at the San Joaquin Valley as a perfect example. Mexico City sits in a dry riverbed. There is a lot of things that we've done globally that weren't the best, but we didn't know. We know now, we didn't know then. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much where we're at. There's nothing we can do to force them to play ball. They are suffering though. And that should give you some solace, I guess. <laughs> no, that's great. And that's, that's all very, all very true. And we have a, a, a question in here in the chat, uh, in the Q&A saying, uh, that's awesome. Are, are you available for parties? <laughs> I am so much fun at parties. I led into my last like event with my friends with, do you guys know how many dead anthrax filled reindeer there are in the Russian tundra that are thawing? And everyone's like, Sonny, stop have like, another drink <laughs> well uh, there's there's more <laughs> <laughs> there's um there's another one here it says um do you believe the earth is in a cycle i remember large winters many years ago and there and now we're seeing more change that may just be a uh, may is that just a cycle so I, I do like that question um there is something to be said about not having data from let's say the 1700s and if your argument is what if it's going back to the 1700s? That, that's fine. The downside is, is we didn't have the infrastructure we have now or the population that we have now, the dependencies, the need for functionality, for globalism, for our, our supply chain. We get our food from other states. Yeah. We don't live off a farm anymore. And the problem is, even if we are going back to the 1700s, conceptually, if that's your, your stance, right? That we're, we're still not ready for it. We didn't build to that either. So... I don't want to. I don't want to say that I have all the answers, and I don't believe that many climate scientists have all of the answers. When we go back that far in data, we're using tree rings, soil samples, journals from farmers from medieval times. We go through a lot of data to be able to give you what we can give you, which is that if it's the hottest it's been, and we're comparing it to the compression layers of the soil, the different materials in the soil, the tree rings, that's all data that we're pulling from from the earth already from the things that we can touch. But we've changed things. We've built into the forest. We've cleared the forest, which we didn't have back then. We have done more now building into these things without thinking about what if it went back. You know, like let's say it goes back to the, the warmth in which the, the dinosaurs lived. There were giant lizards that could eat people back then. I can't run that fast. I don't wanna go back to that. I would like to not, or at least to, not have my house get destroyed so that I have to go live with the giant lizards either way. So, so just, you know, thinking about all the information that you, uh, that you presented and I told you, I told everybody before you presented, right. Don't try to read sunny slides, just absorb. Um, and so, so that's, that's great. How do you think emergency managers should start to take in and, try to understand all of this information. Where, where does this play in the emergency management life cycle? 
So there's a lot to be said. I gave a presentation in California and uh, the regional manager came up after me and he was like, so Sunny's giving you an elephant. She's told you to eat the elephant. And you're like, I've never eaten an elephant. I don't know how to eat the elephant. And I'm like, ah, I'd eat it. I don't know. I've also never eaten an elephant. And they're like, well, you have to start somewhere, but where do you start? How do you start to eat an elephant? So that's where we try to work with the emergency managers to figure out where is the best spot for you to eat the elephant for the elephant that I'm giving you, right? Like everyone's got an elephant and it's all the weather problems because we're all going to see all of the weather problems. Just because the drought is worse right now in the West does not mean it won't get to that point in the East. So you have to understand that maybe drought isn't your main concern right now if you're in the East. What part of the elephant is the most damaging for you right now? What will be the most damaging in 10 years? What can you do in 10 years? If you're along the coast, can you start building some of the artificial coral reefs? Can you increase your seagrass? Can you look at flood walls, flood gates, deployable flood gates for your local locations? Uh, looking out east, looking at wildfire, how can you prevent hydrophobic layers from developing? What does tree clearing really look like going forward since we started fighting every wildfire like every wildfire is bad? And a good majority of them are not all bad. So looking at how to change things region by region requires the emergency managers. I haven't lived in your state for 25 years, but maybe you have, maybe you know your topography, your lowest lying elevation point, you know where the wells are. How much are those wells pulling out? How much is that ground dropping? Is that area now lower than this area? My topography maps do not update at the rate at which your knowledge of the area updates. And I need that back and forth exchange to be able to find out for you, what causes the most damage to your community? Is it tornadoes? Is it high wind? Is it ice? How much ice is too much ice for your most critical buildings that allow your society to function at that local level? And that part is so crucial to start getting that back and forth exchange so that we can change our forecasts to really focus on the impact to your community. Yes, the weather is happening, why should you, the emergency manager, care? And what can you do about it to prevent it from being damaging or at least reduce it? Yeah, no, that, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And I, I wanted to turn your attention for a moment uh, to Southwest Florida and Hurricane Ian. Um, you know, we, we, had, uh, we had a great forecast. Uh, the meteorological community would, would all say the Hurricane Center's forecast was great uh, with the cone. Um, Fort Myers was always in the cone. Um, what do we do uh, to help those people who are in the emergency management roles, uh, maybe that aren't really emergency managers, but are law enforcement, uh, to understand the seriousness of the forecasts of the National Hurricane Center or of the National Weather Service when they talk about impacts? How do we get that education down the road that they're either not qualified to question the forecast or they should understand it and take it from there and really run. So that, that comes down to a lot to like the, the human studies, right? The humanistic yeah. version of, I take this information and I've lived, I used to live in Florida. For those of you who didn't know, I lived through all of that, that year where we just got an insane amount. I named each one of my cats that I found that year after uh, yeah, Hurricane Charlie, I am, Ivan Francis, all of them. Uh, I drove through Hurricane Katrina when I was a kid. Like there was a lot in that uh, Florida area that I grew up in where they're like, oh, it's cool. The, the streets are flooded. Let's go play in the flooded streets. And my mom was like, an anaconda will eat you. Don't do that. And I was like, I, what's an anaconda? Because we were from Arizona. So it didn't make any sense. But coming into Florida and talking to the neighbors and they're like, hurricanes are a joke here. We don't evacuate for anything. We evacuated for one hurricane that entire time that I lived in Florida. And my dad was livid. He hated that we had to go anywhere. He hated the hotel. He was mad at the meteorologist. I will tell you, he is not the greatest supporter of my career field, but he did not like the fact that he had to stop what he was doing to go to safety because he cared about his family and his company told him he had to. But for everyone else whose company is not gonna tell them to evacuate because they work in any other industry than what my dad worked in, they're, they're staying put most of the time because it is, it's an inconvenience to evacuate. Sure, I get it. Conceptually you're like, well, if my house is damaged, I should be here to do what? I don't know, but I should be here. So a lot of people argue, I've been through hurricanes. It's not that bad. I don't need to go. I've, you know, my area has been through five hurricanes that were category four. Nah. 
how do you talk to them? How do you get the police to like know what's coming? A lot of that comes down to, I would argue, the damaged areas, right? Is Are the police officers in the area that was in the forecast cone that was safe, are they being used in the area that took damage so that they understand what that damage looks like, what it did to that community? Are they being tasked out? How do you get them to understand the depth of the damage that could happen? How do you get them to care about the community? That unfortunately comes down a lot to the human experience. So the more times that they experience that they're fine, and I'm not saying the forecast in any way, shape or form is at fault because it is not, you're right. We had that nailed down. A lot of people died who did not need to die. Uh, that That is the sad truth of it is that a lot of people did not evacuate and they should have. I watched houses get lifted off their foundation and just go, the whole house. I watched a restaurant leave. The before and after pictures are devastating and it's still not enough. So moving people by semi-force, maybe some of those areas when you go to rebuild into them, like Louisiana, maybe some of them are not rebuilt into a bowl because the damage is there. It's getting so much worse. If you put another house there, how are you going to make it resilient to a category five? Let's say that we start increasing our hurricanes with intensity and we have a category six. What house is built to a category five or six for more than what, an hour of wind? An hour can still rip your roof off. So yeah. unfortunately, yeah. I don't have an answer to that. It it saddens me that we're at this stage in 2023. We have these before and after pictures, drone footage, you know, personal stories. They live in the state, but if they're not physically put into the restoration effort, I don't think that they're going to change. Yeah, no, that's that's and it's and it's a conversation across the whole uh, meteorological weather enterprise. Um, how to bring that information uh, down to those folks who are in decision making uh, levels. Uh, to really understand uh, the weather forecast and the impacts and all that sort of stuff. Sonny, I, I, I hate to turn it off here. Um, you know, we're right at 430 and uh, looks like we just clicked over to 431. And I just want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, I think if everybody could, uh, there's, you know, clap, uh, we'd hear everybody clapping for your presentation. 